first two weeks of August 1941, German Führer Adolf Hitler and the Nazis want to accomplish three things with Operation Barbarossa. One, destroy the Soviet Union and the Bolshevik ideology. Two, starve tens of millions of people to death for Lebensraum for the Germanic race. And three, find the final solution to the Jewish question. In August 1941, it looks like the first two goals will take more time than anticipated, so Hitler and his minions turn their focus on the answer to the final solution. It will be extermination, and it looks like they want to do it immediately. This is War Against Humanity, a subseries of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Operation Barbarossa is now two months young. Tens of thousands of Jews have already died at the hands of the Germans and their allies, and local collaborators in violent surges of anti-Semitism. The Soviet Union has been driven from Poland and the Baltic states, leaving tens of thousands of their political prisoners dead, mutilated in their cells and cities. Stalin has initiated a scorched earth policy, depriving the invader of supplies, but also leaving millions of Soviet civilians without food or shelter. Civilians who are now also facing the German hunger plan that will starve over 25 million Soviets to death to feed the German armed forces while eradicating the Slavic and Jewish peoples. And in the first weeks of August, the practical part of this plan is a real issue. The German forces are facing resource and logistical problems, lacking equipment, reinforcements, ammunition, and food. But the hunger plan looks like it's working. One German soldier notes that our supply functions reasonably well, so no one can complain even when, of course, we are missing fresh vegetables, butter, and so on. They can't complain because they are living off the land. The supply units have already been commandeering foodstuffs, most often without paying, but now, in August, infantry units are ordered to cover their own needs themselves, turning them into a swarm of locusts, leaving behind an empty, barren land. The plunder is feeding into a vicious circle. The behavior of the Germans motivates more people to follow Stalin's orders to join the partisan movement and resist. But the Red Army has made no provisions to support them behind the lines, and to sustain their fight, they too have to live off the land, and in turn plunder what is left or not yet stolen by the Germans, who in turn pursue the partisans even harder, driving yet more people to join them. Already in early July, commander of the German forces and head of the OKH, Franz Halda, noted that there were not enough men in the security divisions to pacify the operational areas. Hitler now concludes that instead of increasing the number of troops, the available ones shall simply be more ruthless to secure success in the East. On July 22nd, chief of the UKV, Wilhelm Keitel, supplemented Hitler's Directive 33. The troops available for securing the conquered eastern territories will, in view of the size of this area, be sufficient for their duties only if the occupying power meets resistance not by legal punishment of the guilty, but by striking such terror into the population that it loses all will to resist. The commanders concerned are to be held responsible, together with their troops at their disposal, for quiet conditions in their areas. They will contrive to maintain order not by requesting reinforcements, but by employing suitably draconian methods. Orders that will feed into the vicious circle with more reprisals that feeds resistance, that feeds new reprisals, and so on. On Crete, we can see this in operation. Here, Alexander André has now taken over command from Kurt Student. Although the fighting has been over since June, the Fallschirmjäger continue their reprisals. On the 1st of August, around 150 civilians from the area in and around Alikianos are forced to dig their own graves and then shot. On the same day, the rate of murder suddenly rises all along the eastern German lines. It seems like something has snapped across the board, like there is no longer any inhibition at all left in the German forces and their allies. But it's a snap that has been long in preparation. It's been a gradual process of dehumanizing people considered to be undesirable in the racist Nazi fantasies, especially those perceived as Jewish, 
And it began as soon as the Nazis took power in Germany a little more than eight years ago in 1933. It started with rhetoric, chickenry, humiliation, and occasional outbreaks of spontaneous violence. Then came judicial oppression by exclusion from society and the work market. With Reichspogromnacht in November 1938, a new tipping point was reached when in the aftermath of public destruction of Jewish property and violence against Jews, tens of thousands of men considered to be Jewish were interned in the concentration camp system. With the invasion of Poland came the ghettoization of Jews, concentrating them into tiny areas under subhuman circumstances. Since the fall of France and the Benelux countries in June 1940, the Nazis have been deporting more and more Jews from occupied Western Europe and Germany to the Polish ghettos, exasperating the situation there even further. Throughout, resistance by Jews or sympathizers has been violently and systematically quashed by thousands of armed SS men using torture and murder, rendering any effective resistance virtually impossible. By mid-1941, the effect is that the oppressed have now been forced into a life in hunger, filth, and squalor. So the Nazis have artificially made their own prejudices come true by gradually pressing the Jewish minority, including anyone perceived to be part of that minority, into a, a subhuman existence. The dehumanization continues to pick up speed as they round up more and more Jews, expropriate even the poorest, hoard them into cattle cards and living quarters unfit for humans, while providing not even the most basic sanitary solutions, turning their victims into wretches in rags. In parallel, they have been steadily increasing the acceptance of torture and murder as a tool in their political and physical war. From the street violence and spontaneous mass incarcerations of the SA, they progressed to Theodor Eike's Dachau system in the concentration camps to systematically break the inmates. Then followed Reinhard Heydrich's Einsatzgruppen, created first to liquidate political opponents inside Germany, and then to execute mass murders of potential sources of resistance in Poland. There, in 1939, began the integration of the Wehrmacht into the SS liquidation operations. At first, the Wehrmacht resisted, and Heydrich and the SS failed to get the full cooperation of the Wehrmacht during the Western invasion. But by June 1941, Hitler, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, and Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring have turned the Wehrmacht leadership not only to acceptance, but active collaboration to mass murder of civilians as an acceptable tool to wage war. When they gain more and more control of larger parts of Europe, the methods they use attracts like-minded groups within their allies like the Romanian fascists and the Croatian Ustasche, who add further minorities and ethnicities to the killing lists and more bloodthirst to the horde that is now overrunning Europe. By now, even executing children in the most gruesome ways is not foreign to the Nazi coalition. During the summer, the Ustasche have started using vertical cave entrances as a means of execution in their effort to exterminate the Serbs. They simply throw entire families into the holes in the rock by the hundreds. The victims either die from the drop or wounded. They are pinned down by the other victims, leaving them to die a slow, grueling death. On August 6th alone, around 600 men, women, children, and infants from Prebilovci are thrown to their death in the Golubinka pit. We covered the cave massacres in more detail on our Instagram World War II Day by Day feed. There, you will find many daily events that we don't always have time to cover in these and the weekly episodes. In any case, the escalation of violence has now reached monstrous proportions, and as we have seen, it's even pulling in ordinary civilians in orgies of torture and murder of their neighbors. For Hitler, this is what he calls the true war, or the war against the Jews. So far, it has not been followed uh, with a precise plan, but evolved according to organic, slow escalation. 
Sure, Himmler and Heydrich have been looking at various alternatives to the final solution of the Jewish question, but until now not settled on a concise universal plan. It is Herbert Marker's hunger plan, the spontaneous pogroms of July and their own Generalplan Ost to ethnically cleanse the Slavs that seems to give Himmler and Heydrich the inspiration to abandon all restraints. Within these plans, Himmler now moves some goals around and changes some methods. He decides that it will first be the Jews who are to give up their calories. The SS units, who were previously tasked with killing the Soviet elites, are now exclusively tasked with killing Jews. Timothy Snyder offers a fitting analysis. Himmler ignored what was impossible, pondered what was most glorious, and did what could be done, killed the Jews east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, in occupied eastern Poland, the Baltic states, and the Soviet Union. And now, in the first weeks of August 1941, shootings of Jews on a massive scale begin, where initially mostly men were killed, women and children are now also indiscriminately murdered. Einsatzkommandos, Sonderkommandos, and other SS formations now tasked with killing Jews are now not only operating in the rear of the fighting forces, but in active combat zones, further blurring the lines between the Wehrmacht and the SS. Murders are often logged in detail by the SS, and when they transmit their situation reports, these are picked up by the Western Allies, who can decode them as they have cracked the German ciphers. The list is too long to go through and ranges from single-digit murders to the execution of thousands at once. Here are a few examples. On August 1st, Sonderkommando 10A of Einsatzgruppe D under SS Gruppenführer Otto Ohlendorf carry out raids against the Jewish populace of Kodima, Ukraine. 1,756 Jews are taken hostage. The operational situation report notes that hostages were executed on the slightest pretext. Einsatzkommando 11b reports that they have concentrated the Jews in Thignia on the 7th, of which they have shot 155. Einsatzkommando 9 of Einsatzgruppe B under SS Brigadenführer Arto Nebe shoots 320 women and children in Vileika after the Einsatzkommando 7a had already killed all men a few weeks before. Einsatzkommando 8 kills all 700 inhabitants of the Semben Ghetto. On the 2nd, Police Battalion 322 under SS and Police Leader von den Bachselewski is ordered to deploy a company which will be exclusively used for the liquidation of Jews. On the 9th, they arrest all 77 male Jews between the age of 16 and 45 in Bialovica. They are shot the day after. The same company shoots 281 male Jews and one Pole in Kobrin on the 15th. In the Pripyat Marshes, the SS Cavalry Brigade, under command of Hermann Fegelein, is supposed to cleanse the area of Jews. In July, Himmler had issued Regimental Order No. 42, sending the cavalry there to comb the marshes using mounted units, shoot anyone suspected of supporting partisans, remove their women and children, steal the cattle and provisions, and then burn down the villages. Many Jews joined the partisans to fight back, leaving their families behind to, in the worst case, get removed. But on August 1st, the order is amended with a new line. Explicit order from the Reichsführer SS. All Jews must be shot. Drive Jewish women into the marshes to be drowned. The SS 1st Cavalry Regiment, under command of SS Sturmbannführer Gustav Lombard, passes on the order to his men like this. No male Jew stays alive. No residual family in the villages. Lombard refers to his method as entjudo, de-Jewification, already a common term used for excluding Jews from the German economy. Finding out that driving women into the swamps is harder than anticipated, the men shoot them instead. They will go on to kill all Jews they encounter, committing mass murder in, among other places, Chomsk, Motol, Telechani, Sviatvia, Volia, and Hansavici. After one week, they report that they have shot 6,504 people, but the actual number is probably closer to 11,000. Within two weeks, they have murdered the entire Jewish population in an area of over 4,000 square kilometers. 
In the first week of August, the 2nd SS Cavalry Regiment under command of SS Sturmbannführer Franz Magill reports shooting another 6,526. The actual number is closer to 14,000. They are methodical and relentless in their operations. A platoon enters a village ordering the mayor to point out the Jewish population. Soldiers then go house to house arresting all the Jews. Some are shot point blank, others gathered to be shot in larger groups. Sometimes they are buried, sometimes they're just left out in the open. Historian Henny Pipa adds that collaborators not only helped to identify Jews, local militiamen also rounded them up, guarded them on the march to the execution sites and took part in the killings. The majority of the killing by the 2nd Regiment in early August is done in the mid-sized city of Pinsk with around 26,000 Jewish citizens. The actions in Pinsk are overseen by SS Gruppenführer Erich von den Barzelewski and the Wehrmacht General Max von Scheckendorf, commanding the rare area of the Army Group Center. On August 6, under the pretext of having to perform forced labor, all Jews are told by the local Judenrat to assemble at the train station. Henning Pieper explains what follows. More than 2,000 Jews were then driven out of Pinsk in a marching column. Along the way, some of them managed to escape. The others carried on until they reached an open field where several mass graves had been prepared by the collaborators. A chain of SS guards surrounded them. And the Jews were told to kneel down or lie on the ground. In groups, they were led to the pits where they were shot in the neck by the troopers. Upon seeing this, some of those who were waiting panicked, broke through the cordon and ran away across the field where most of them were shot. Preserved radio messages from the 2nd Regiment indicate that 2,461 people were killed by midday. The massacres go on for three days and takes the life of between six and 8,000 of the Jews of Pinsk. These are only a few of the mass murders of the first weeks of August, two weeks when Nazi murderous fantasies are now become a reality. It is a reality meticulously orchestrated by the Nazi leadership and documented in detail by its perpetrators. For the remainder of 1941, in only five months, over one million Jews will be murdered east of the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, even before any final solution is formally enacted. All across the eastern lands, the blood of the innocent is now being poured into the ground. Millions of blood drops that will gather into thousands of crimson creeks that will soon flow together into a raging river of suffering. It's hard to fathom to not mention understand how this can happen, but it did, and it was carried out by people like all of us. That's what we must remember and at least try to understand, because it can happen again. That is why we here at Time Goes try our best to bring you the factual history, free of ideological presumptions and without an agenda to promote simple solutions. Become a part of this effort by joining the Time Ghost Army on Patreon.com or TimeGhost.tv. Never forget. <laughs>